Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. Three successive lead investigators have tried for over 10 years to solve a potential Jane Doe murder case. There are no reports, no witnesses, no leads, not even a name. All they have are human skeletal remains that were washed ashore and scattered around Gilbert Island near Fredericton, New Brunswick. Fall 1992. A duck hunter travels to the island to build a blind. It's a wild, uninhabited place, isolated from the rest of the world by the waters of the St. John River. Suddenly, in a pile of dead branches and driftwood, the hunter makes a grisly discovery. Unaware of the consequences for the investigation, he moves the skull and goes to notify the police. I'm already beginning to think, how did it get there? Along the St. John uh, River system, there have been occasions that the old uh, burial grounds were uh, close to shore, and we have had occasions where some of them have washed away. So you have to think that. You have to think, is it a missing person? Uh, you have to think, is it foul play? RCMP Corporal Dave Brown and Joseph Hine, a forensic technician, accompany the hunter to the island. If the hunter really has found human remains, the investigation is liable to be complicated. The skull was actually in the crotch of a branch of a tree. The, the gentleman that had found it had picked it up and put it there so he would be able to find it again. The skull is not complete. The entire lower jawbone, or mandible, is missing along with several teeth. There is nothing left on the bone, not a shred of flesh. Joseph Hine takes the skull to the forensic lab. We still don't know what we have. We don't know if this is a, a suicide or an accident or, or a murder. So you treat it like a murder um, until you know otherwise. The hunter shows the investigators where he actually found the skull. It's quite a big island. They put. Uh, cows on there in the in the summertime to graze, so it's it's fairly big. I'd be taking a wild guess, but I'd have to say 30 or 40 acres anyway. Uh, but it floods almost completely in the spring. Like I would say, virtually the entire island is underwater in the spring. The three of us uh, just had a look around, just a cursory look about 100 yards around the skull to, uh, to see if we could find any other bones or any other indication of a body and we didn't find anything. Moira McLaughlin is a forensic anthropologist from St. Thomas University in Fredericton. Investigators assist her in the search of the island for more remains. This river is deceptive. It looks very wide and peaceful and beautiful, and yet the actual channel of the river is quite narrow. Most of what we see is overflow. The uh, current in the channel is exceptionally strong. Um, remains, a body could be carried very, very rapidly, many kilometers in, 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 in hours. The island is subject to flooding. It's possible the water either deposited the skull there or carried the skeleton downriver. 
And as we were coming up to the back side of the island, I saw a nesting pair of eagles, and I think that'll always remind me, and, and in retrospect, it was uh, rather prophetic. Before starting the search, the team examines the island and discusses a plan of attack. The search team consists mostly of volunteers. They receive clear instructions to protect the scene and preserve the tiniest pieces of evidence. In an area that we thought perhaps would be outside of the area that we might have to concentrate on, we started uh, locating small bones. And as the search progressed, as we're going down the grid, uh, we noted that we were finding more and more. Among the bones, the search team also finds tattered remains of clothing. The underwear and the sock uh, were in such a condition that they really told us very little other than bones were found in them. So we were able to deduce that they were on at the time of death. Um, so that's an important clue. After several days, the team discovers what looks like a little ball of animal fur or human hair. The little hair will be carefully retrieved and sent to the forensic laboratory. And as we walked upstream along the island, this uh, scattering of bones became more and more narrow uh, until we found an area where there was a lot of um, dead branches and, and debris. And in that pile of dead branches and everything else, we found uh, some of the larger bones. And the area where the skull was found was, was quite a distance from this fanning out. So the water had, had uh, moved it uh, quite a distance, actually. Finally, an almost complete skeleton has been collected. Maybe 80% of it, there was, uh, the feet weren't there, but they're very small bones and they're so light that they could be carried away. Where the postcranial body was, that is everything below the cranium was found, had been flooded many times. And those little bones of the hands and the wrist and of the feet and the ankles would easily have been swept away. The water has hidden a key piece of the puzzle, the lower jawbone. Without that, it will be next to impossible for a forensic expert to determine the shape of the face. We did several searches of the island. We never did find the jaw because, you know, water took that away. It took away the important thing. The police have not found any distinctive marks on the bones. No personal items other than clothing. No concrete evidence that could help them identify the victim. There's a very big challenge here. You're not only challenged as a police officer to determine was there a crime, and if so, who committed it. Uh, the challenge is also the identification. Who is this person? You have a mystery. Identifying the victim is crucial. Once that's done, the investigators will be able to construct probable scenarios to explain how the skull came to be on the island. The person could have come out by themselves, by boat, died there by whatever means, and the boat floated away or, or whatever. Or somebody could have brought the individual out there and, and, and maybe killed the person there. Or a body could have floated up there out of the water. There were all those possible scenarios, and you can't dismiss one or the other so early in the case. Moira McLaughlin tackles the job of examining the bones to try and build a biological profile of the victim a kind of preliminary sketch for the police. She starts by delicately cleaning the bones, just enough so that she will not miss any clues, like the marks of trauma that might point to a murder. I'm always quite careful about, uh, about how much cleaning there should be, especially bones that I know have been immersed in water for a while because uh, it, bones can soften in, uh, if they're in water for a long period of time. So judicious cleaning, uh, 
laying it out in anatomical order and then doing an inventory of, of the remains. Investigators ask her to determine if the skeleton is male or female. None of these determinations are 100% because the traits that we use for determining uh, sex um, appear at puberty and develop during puberty. And there have been cases where there has been such an imbalance in the hormones that somebody who was actually biologically a female skeletally looked to be a male. We were fortunate in this regard to, to have the pelvis. Uh, so the, all of the traits pointed clearly towards it uh, being a female. McLaughlin compares the skeleton's measurements to standard human growth patterns to determine how old the woman may have been. So in adult skeletons and skeletons that have completed their growth, uh, we tend to find ages in, in decades or even in, in 20 years to say somebody is between 40 and 60, for example. Um, in this particular case, there was just an indication that this individual was at the end of their skeletal growth. And so we were able to say that, the, that we could put the skeleton in the area of early to mid-20s. The next thing to determine is the woman's racial background. This is done by measuring the size and shape of the skull, particularly around the eyes and nose. Identifying race from skeletal remains is not an exact science. Nonetheless, after taking dozens of measurements, Moira McLaughlin arrives at a conclusion. In the first analysis, um, the morphological traits pointed towards this individual being Caucasian. The examination of the skeleton has revealed one particular feature of the victim that should make it much easier to identify her. The uh, left humerus, that is the upper arm bone, was smaller both in length and in uh, thickness than the right humerus. It would have been uh, uh, noticeable in the individual and in fact probably would have reduced the ability of that individual to use their arm. Every indication was that she was probably born with it that it was a genetic um, abnormality. Police used the information collected by McLaughlin to produce an identification record for the victim. Then she'll be added to the missing person's database. Not only is she added to the database, but she is compared to all the other women who have been reported missing in the country. Dave Brown can use these characteristics to shine new light on the local investigation. Leads slowly begin to come in that may help identify this woman with no name. Dave Brown gets calls from investigators in New Brunswick, Quebec, and Maine. Investigators now look at the woman's teeth for more clues to her identity. Dr. David Sweet is a forensic odontologist he will examine the teeth that have remained in the skull and create a profile. It can be used much like a fingerprint to help identify someone. We do an examination of the person's teeth and we produce a dental record, much the way a dentist would in a private practice. This dental profile of the victim can be compared to the dental record of a missing person. There's no national database for missing persons dental records that would be very helpful but it's not present and so instead what we use is circumstantial evidence found at the scene of the crime there may be some clue that leads us to believe that this certain person is the one that's dead then we can go to their medical record their dental record and we can obtain from their dentist any records that might be useful to compare to the teeth that are present in the victim's body to see if those records match. Dr. Sweet can only make a partial report because he only has the upper jaw. But he observes that the victim has had intensive dental care to correct major problems with her teeth and that her front teeth protruded. Dave Brown looks at the clothing found during the search of the island. Although the black jeans and white blouse are in poor condition, they will produce some facts. Uh, there was very little left 
of the blouse and the jeans. They were mostly rotted. Um, but we were able to find the labels. So one of the things that I wanted to do, uh, and that's getting back to where's the person from, is there any clue that is going to help us, was to look to determine where were these bought? Are these something that are available everywhere? Uh, are they even Canadian? The Canadian Garment Association refers Brown to a number of manufacturers and retailers. He systematically contacts each one. It's a slow job that requires patience and perseverance. Through many attempts and photographs that were sent to them, uh, I was able to determine that the blouse was made by a Montreal company. And it was only out to one chain of stores, which was a Bargain Herald's stores. And I was able to determine when they were shipped and at, uh, at, at what time. And it was actually only a two month period that those blouses were, were shipped out to the Bargain Heralds. So therefore that gave me some idea of, okay, does that person live around those areas that have Bargain Heralds? So it, it's a way of just narrowing down the search somewhat. Moira McLaughlin once again examines the bones. This time, she will try to determine a cause of death. Even without organs and tissue, the bones can reveal many clues. McLaughlin looks for signs of trauma, healed fractures, and even teeth marks that may have been left by a predator. I was also looking for evidence of perimortem trauma. Bone breaks in different ways. If, if the bone is fresh and it still has all the fat and water in it, it will break, it will, um, it will bend, it will react, respond in a very different way than if the, the bone is dry and it has been out on the surface for a long period of time and all the fat and water is gone from it. So I should be able to tell the difference between a fresh bone response and dry bone response. And if, if it's fresh bone and it shows no sign of healing, that's what we refer to as perimortem. McLaughlin notices marks on some of the ribs. She can't be certain if these marks were caused by the teeth of an animal like a coyote or by the point of a weapon like a knife. Was it suicide, an accident, or homicide? The cause of death remains a mystery. The results of her examination are inconclusive. Years in the river have done a good job of blurring the facts. Damage caused by the water continues to keep the woman's identity a secret. The forensic lab has completed the analysis of the hair. Will the results prove the hair is from the victim or a predatory animal? It's been a year since the skeletal remains have been recovered from Gilbert Island in the St. John River. The investigators have established that the victim was a white woman in her 20s with an underdeveloped left arm and an overbite. Her identity remains a mystery. Hair analysis from a sample recovered from the island show some positive results. They were able to tell me actually quite a lot from that particular hair. Uh, when it was examined and straightened out, it turned out to be 35 centimeters long. They were able to tell me the color was enhanced with a dye. It had been worn in a ponytail style because there was an elastic that had metal threads wrapped around it, and that metal had rusted away. But the rust marks remained 20 centimeters down on the ponytail. Despite this information, they still don't know what the victim looks like. A sketch would allow them to ask the public for help. But without the lower jawbone, creating a composite drawing is nearly impossible. That's a big facial feature, and it really determines what someone looks like. Do they have a small jaw? Do they have a big jaw? If they have a long face, a round face. So that was a key element that we didn't have. How can we do a facial reconstruction? 
At the time, there was also the computer regeneration program that uh, was being developed in Toronto. Dave Brown asked the Centre of Forensic Sciences in Ontario to create a composite drawing based on the information collected. A few weeks later, Brown is transferred to another province. RCMP investigator Philip Uhl takes over the case. He knows it will not be easy. He starts by coordinating another search of the island. I was hoping to find that lower mandible. We don't have much to go on. We were left with not knowing who this person is, where she came from, and also how did she come to be on that island. For two days, a team of 30 people conduct a large-scale operation. They search the island with a fine-tooth comb. Each square inch, each blade was turned over, and we found some small bones, several, but we did not find the part we were looking for, the lower mandible. Moira McLaughlin tries to determine how the skeleton got onto the island. We couldn't figure out how the skull got there without understanding the river movements and the water movements. And that's one of the things I have to do as a forensic anthropologist, is do what we call taphonomy. Everything that happens to a body from the moment the individual dies until it's found. And that could include water movements, movements of the current, the flood movements in the spring, um, what the vegetation is like, has there been any human intervention, were there any scavengers. So part of this taphonomic analysis was learning about the river. McLaughlin studies the flooding water levels of the St. John River. She believes the body could have traveled from as far as Fredericton, over 20 kilometers away. As the spring flood subsided, the body could have become hung up on the island. As it decomposes, it would naturally disarticulate and could become scattered by predators. Moira McLaughlin's taphonomic study will also answer other questions. We also had to know about temperature because the temperature of the water affects decomposition. I want to try to figure out how long the person has been dead. How long does it take for a body to become completely skeletonized? In winter, the water temperature of the river is around zero degrees. In summer, it can get as warm as 18 degrees. McLaughlin estimates that the body has spent between one and two years at the mercy of the water. During this time, the body is battered by the currents and pulled back and forth by the tides. The face, arms, hands, and knees have been torn as they were dragged over the rocks. After a few months in the water, it decomposed and would naturally disarticulate. The skin would gradually come off the body in shreds. The Fredericton RCMP received the composite drawing done by the Centre of Forensic Sciences in Ontario. Moira McLaughlin feels that even though the sketch is based on photos of the skull, it's not a good match and should not be used for a public release. Philip Uhl decides to take the skull and bones to Toronto and create a new composite drawing. McLaughlin begins to doubt her conclusions regarding the victim's race. She takes advantage of the fact that the bones are in Toronto to ask another forensic anthropologist to examine them and to confirm whether or not the victim was Caucasian. The center takes a strong interest in this mysterious case and offers to do a diatom test as well to try and determine whether the victim had drowned. Diatoms are microscopic algae that are found in all bodies of fresh water, such as lakes and rivers. When a person drowns, the diatoms swallowed with the water are collected in the bone marrow, particularly in the femur. Because of the age and condition of the bone samples, the results don't conclude that the victim drowned. Philip Uhl turns to the Canadian Police Information Centre. I made a request of every case available for the maritime area of missing persons, and there was 300 names that came up. 
and you have to manually go through this and review them. Ool receives the new composite drawing based on the victim's skull. It seems to confirm that the victim is Caucasian. For the very first time, the police organize a press release. The composite drawing is published in newspapers throughout the Maritimes and also in Maine and Quebec. The police receive a few leads. They compare them with Jane Doe's dental profile, but they don't correspond to the records of any missing persons. The case is reclassified as a major unsolved crime. Once a week, the police update the file. But as weeks and months go by, no new elements are added. Another year passes. The Major Crimes Unit investigators enlist the help of Michel Fournier. He is one of the best forensic artists in the country. They ask him to do a facial reconstruction of the victim. Obviously, when you get to the point of having someone do a facial reconstruction of a deceased person, it's because all the other parts of the investigation have come up empty. Trying to identify the person through fingerprints or dental records or physical descriptions, they've all drawn a blank. So you've almost reached the end of the road. Michel Fournier has just returned from the FBI Academy. He's been studying a brand new identification technique, three-dimensional reconstruction. As a first case, it was a pretty complicated one because the skull wasn't complete. If you take away the lower jaw and most of someone's teeth, that will change the shape of their face. So that made my job a little more complicated because I had to do a projection of the jaw. As a general rule, it's not something you do randomly. You take account of what you already know. So, for example, even though the teeth were missing, we could use the roots to determine the projection of the teeth. For facial reconstruction, the artist uses 23 markers. These are points on the skull that indicate what the minimum and maximum thickness of the tissue is. The placement of the markers is the first in a long series of steps that requires time, skill, and painstaking work. The muscles, tendons, and fat on the face take shape. Up to this point, the work has been purely scientific. The final touch is the artistic touch that gives some life to the facial reconstruction. The final touch to complete the reconstruction is the hair. The investigators call on an expert wig maker. They have also bought a white blouse like the one Jane Doe was wearing to make the drawing as authentic as possible. It's a revelation for Philip Uhl. It cried out. It was a person, not just a skull. And based on that, I was enthusiastic that this may come to a successful conclusion by identifying this person, who she was, what was her, her history. How did she come to be on the island? Investigators expect a lot more from this more human and lifelike reconstruction. Days and then weeks go by and no one calls. It's a hard blow for the investigation. Dejected that I wasn't able to identify this person. But again, for some reason, the public wasn't coming forward. Now it's Philip Uhl's turn to be transferred. He is reassigned to Ottawa. The Jane Doe case is still open, but it seems doomed to become a cold case. Strange circumstances bring a new player to the case. He will restart the investigation from square one, breathe new life into it, and send it into the newspaper, radio, and television headlines, this time with a new hypothesis.
It has been over 10 years since a human skeleton was discovered on Gilbert Island in the St. John River in New Brunswick. Two successive lead investigators have worked on the case. Now a third will try to solve the mystery of the woman with no name. RCMP analyst Gilles Blin is a specialist in Viclis, the Violent Crime Linkage Analysis System. He is attracted by the challenge and asks for the file. I went through the box. I went through every piece of paper and every statement and every photograph in the box. Remembering that the case had not been solved or we didn't know the identity of the person or what happened to the victim. And I wanted to keep an open mind. I was puzzled for the fact that this victim was found near a large center, had a smaller left arm, a female, and we had a description of her clothes. We actually, we knew where she, the clothes were even bought, and yet it remained unsolved. I found that very intriguing. Why have all the efforts to identify the victim failed over the last 10 years? Jill Blinn tries to find an explanation. There was a couple of possibilities. A, that the person was never reported missing. Two, she was from another country. She could have been from the United States, but we checked that as well. So now if she was missing from, for example, Germany or Europe, we would check with Interpol to see if they had uh, a person reported missing matching the description of this victim. So what I did is I took her poster or her, her, her photo and I had that by my desk all the time and some people might think this is corny but I felt throughout all of this that she was guiding me through the process here and I felt that eventually I was going to get an identity. Gilles Blinn calls a meeting with Moira McLaughlin and Michelle Fournier. He asked them to go back to square one, nearly 10 years later. There's a new energy. We're going to formulate a new plan. We're going to start investigating this, this case and see if we can't resolve it. Blaine has an advantage over his predecessors. Forensic science has progressed dramatically in the past 10 years. Today, there are completely new, effective techniques like DNA analysis. The first one was DNA. That, that's, that's the big one. We didn't have that in 1992. The best source of DNA, if you have a skeletal remain, is a, a tooth. Gio Blinn sends the skull to the Bold Lab at the University of British Columbia. He hopes they can extract DNA from the teeth, despite the fact that they have spent many years in the waters of the St. John River. The teeth, because of the armor coating, can protect the DNA over a period of time from the influence of water. When we received the skull, I selected two teeth that I thought would be important sources of DNA evidence. We extracted them and crushed them using liquid nitrogen and a machine called a freezer mill. We take the whole tooth and decontaminate the outside surface using special chemicals that will destroy DNA but then we put it into a closed system, so none of the DNA from the tooth can escape, but more importantly, no DNA from a person who's analyzing the sample or any other source can get access inside that area. So now we know that when the DNA result comes in the end, we've got that from the tooth and from nothing else. Dr. Sweet is able to create a DNA profile of the victim. It's a huge step, but it means nothing if they don't have a family member to compare the results with. Forensic analysis is a comparison between um, two samples, and many people believe that when you have a body or when you can collect a sample from a body, you can solve the crime. In fact, you might be able to obtain a DNA profile, but it doesn't actually solve the crime until you come up with a suspicion who that person is and then you can compare a known sample that's taken from them to be sure that um, you've identified the person. 
the identity of the woman with no name remains a mystery. But Gilles Blin believes that the signs had taken them down the wrong track with regard to the victim's race. I've worked in this area for several years, and I've worked with First Nations people on numerous occasions. As a matter of fact, there's several First Nations community in the area that I patrol, and there is no specific reason why I can say this, but my feeling, and right deep in my heart, I felt she was from First Nations. Looking at her, the, the reconstruction Michelle had made, it's a strong feeling that I had that she was a First Nations person. When he shares his intuitions about the victim's Aboriginal background with Moira McLaughlin, she brings him back to the scientific reality. During the whole course of, of this investigation, uh, two other physical anthropologists independently had an opportunity to analyze the remains. And uh, all of them saw the same morphology in the cranium, and that is uh, a morphology that's indicative of uh, Caucasian. Blinn is persistent, and McLaughlin agrees to completely revisit her analysis of the victim's race. I went back over the bones again. New eyes, fresh eyes, after several years. A lot more experience, many more cases. New methods had appeared, particularly in the microscopic area. A, a new system called 4DISC had been developed, a, com a, a computer database. This software will give her a new biological profile to compare with a database of skeletal measurements of modern humans. The person was a living human being at one point. She had a life. She had parents, perhaps people that loved her, perhaps children. And, you know, it's sad that someone met her fate and floated down a river by herself and stayed there for two years it's a terrible story. And I felt really sad for this victim. As long as the victim remains unidentified, the investigators cannot begin to explore the probable causes of her death. Will McLaughlin's new analysis prove Gilles Blin's hypothesis is correct? A year has passed since Jill Blinn reopened a 10-year-old Jane Doe cold case. Dr. David Sweet has created a genetic profile of the victim. Moira McLaughlin has reanalyzed the skeleton using new techniques in order to, once again, confirm the victim's race. The results from the 4DISC software arrive, and much to Jill Blinn's frustration, they again suggest the victim was Caucasian. Moira McLaughlin doesn't know what to think. How can we look at this? Uh, I, I mean, here on the one hand, I've got the science telling me that it's a Caucasian female, and we should be able to, in a small area like the Maritimes, find her. And we thought about the fact that, uh, that in the Atlantic provinces, for over 400 years, uh, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Europeans have been living intimately with each other, marrying, raising families together, and, and sort of collectively as a group, we said, let's broaden it. Let's broaden this biological profile and open it up. Let's look at her ancestry being Mi'kmaq or Maliseet, and that was the starting point. With a new approach, Gilles Blin does another search in the Canadian Police Information Centre database. He searches from 1991 to 2001, and this time, he includes people of Aboriginal origin. There was an excess of 5,000 missing females. I think I had 300 and odd pages of, of missing women uh, on those printouts, so I had quite a few to go through. But you gotta remember, not all of them are, are uh, victims of foul play. Some of them are missing for some odd reasons, runaways and so on. There's a great number that are missing due to foul play, but not all. Months of laborious work yield nothing. 5,000 missing women are checked, and 5,000 are ruled out. The conclusion was uh, there was no match. Simple. I looked at them and then looked at them and looked at them again in the hopes of finding a match. 
and I didn't find any. Gio Blaine decides to call on the media throughout the country. One of the largest television networks in Canada agrees to do a special report on the reopening of the case. Well, two things can happen. Number one, we're going to get a lot of tips, and it's going to keep me busy for a long time. Or number two, we're not going to get any tips at all. Thousands of posters are printed and sent to all the police agencies across Canada and the northeastern United States. Gilles Blin also contacts police forces overseas. Days turn into weeks, and weeks into months. And once again, there is nothing but false leads. Thinking back, I had a lot of tips, but they were all vague tips. They didn't pan out. I was asked numerous times, do you get discouraged when a lead doesn't pan out? I said, no, I don't get discouraged, I just get more determined. That year, the fall in Fredericton is dreary and wet. Many people find the atmosphere depressing. The suicide rate hits an all-time high. There was a rash of homeless people from the city throwing themselves in the river to commit suicide. Those events triggered these thoughts that had us. I, I want to say a light bulb came on, or I had an idea. There's a local soup kitchen where homeless people, people that are down on their lock, they go and they have their meals. And that was the first place I went. Blaine hopes that someone will remember her. He calls the manager, George Pierce. Pierce has an excellent memory. He remembers a strange, solitary woman who regularly came to the soup kitchen in the 1980s. He says the drawing is not quite right. Her face was rounder, more wrinkled. He also remembers that the woman had one arm that was shorter than the other. It was her left arm. I felt good about it. I thought, okay, we're on the right track. I felt that was the first solid lead we had in several years. Pierce told him something else. The woman always had a pair of very long scissors. She seemed to carry them for self-defense. George Pierce can still clearly remember the last time he saw her. It was in September of 1990. She was hitchhiking next to the highway. Since he was driving in the opposite direction, he didn't stop. After that, he often wondered what had happened to her. Gio Blin calls the forensic artist, Michel Fournier. He says he would like to modify the drawing of the woman. George Pierce explains that the lower part of her face was fuller and that she had buck teeth. And more importantly, that the skin on her cheeks and neck were more wrinkled. With this new sketch, Gio Blin again notifies the media about the case. In a very short time, the police receive a phone call from the owner of an old building downtown. He believes he recognizes the woman they are looking for. Jill Blinn pays him a visit. He had not seen this person for several years, and uh, he didn't know where she was. And by viewing the composite drawing, he felt that perhaps this person was the victim that was found on the island. She was a solitary, quiet woman who lived on social assistance. He said she never cashed her last check. The owner remembers her name and knows where her parents live. And Constable Cole followed up on that, met with family members, and obtained some genetic material for DNA testing, and uh, a match occurred and the victim was identified. The victim was in fact Aboriginal. Her parents, who lived on a reserve a few kilometers from Fredericton, 
had never reported her missing. They thought that she had simply left and hoped that someday she would return. Uh, I knew we were going to find something. I knew that, that, that it was going to be uh, important and that these eagles were connected in some way with that individual. And uh, as it turned out, um, they were important birds to this woman too in her cultural life. So whether they were looking after her, whether they were bringing us there, I don't know, but uh, for me, there's a connection. And I'm glad they were there. Yeah. I can't explain the feeling it is when the victim, all of a sudden we know who it is, we were able to bring that victim home. Now spiritually, that victim is now able to rest in peace. Gio Blin has finally put a name to a decade-old case file. Out of respect for her family, we will leave her secret in the waters of the St. John River.